All right, everybody. Hi, welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, getting started with uh, data management. And uh, we had received lots of questions, uh, especially now that there are um, some new ways of working with the data store. And so we thought an interactive webinar is one of the ways that we could help answer as many questions and also create this as a reference for anyone who happens to be looking uh, a little bit later. So this will be recorded. I'm sure we'll post it to YouTube. But in the meantime, um, please feel free um, to chat your questions. Um, that might be super efficient. We're in a meeting, um, so you could potentially um, raise your hand and have a discussion. But what I'll try to do is uh, give you some very short background to make sure we're all on the same page. And then also um, uh, give you something of a live demo. The things that we're gonna show at least at the beginning are fairly straightforward, but if you have more complex questions, uh, we're here for those too. I'm also joined by my colleague, Rob Merchant, University of Arizona, uh, who is the uh, Cybers co-PI and will answer questions I can, as well as Tina Lee, also from Cybers at University of Arizona, who will help us. And I'm Jason Williams at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York. So let's get right into this so we have the most amount of time for questions. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and put into slideshow mode. And I believe this is looking good. So I will go ahead and start here. All right. Uh, so um, this is a modification, if you know the Simpsons quote about beer, uh, the cause of and solution to all of our problems is data. Uh, so no matter what type of uh, work you are using Cypress for, almost certainly it's going to have a big data component. And it's really important for us to know how to manage that uh, effectively. I could make probably several webinars on effective data management, talking about everything from their data to metadata handling. And if you do have questions, I'll talk about those. But today I'm just gonna talk about some really basic things, which is uh, managing data in the context of not having unlimited resources and being wise about how you share and move and hold data at Cybers to make the most of your subscription. So, um, when it comes to data, bigger data means bigger problems. Uh, for those of you, I guess I have a strong molecular biology event because that's my background. Uh, when you are working in the uh, lab, you know, a dropper and a pipette does the same thing. A magnifying glass and a microscope, they both do the same thing, except that when you move from, you know, um, a more crude instrument uh, that is uh, sort of at a, at a different scale, than when you're working with the microscope, all of a sudden you need new technologies. You have to have a technician who calibrates things. You have all those, those sorts of things. And so normally on a laptop or computing or, or desktop top mindset and technology, uh, today things are pretty much backed up. I mean, I have with me, maybe it'll show up here kind of in the, <laughs> uh, there we go. I uh, can't blur, blur it out there. I've got my little disc. We're no longer pressing a button and listening. Uh, for those of you who are old enough to see if something has been written to disk, uh, things is sort of seem to happen automatically. Um, but when you're working really with really big data sets and you're working with a, a cyber infrastructure, there's still concerns that you want to be aware of and informed of so they make the best, best decisions. You know, these things that I have on the screen are all things that you could run into and that I think I'd argue Cybers does fairly well, but you do need to uh, know how to do it and have a place like today to get your questions. Uh, some of you are familiar with the variety of tools and services that Cybers offers. Although in this slide, I sort of circle uh, some of those things, you know, really everything depends upon data. It, it, it underlines all of the services. Um, there are definite, definitely technologies which deal with how those data are handled or managed or backed up or authentication to keep the data secure or even other um, data systems that we might interact with like Exceed. Um, so there is you know, various levels of where things, some things are gonna be easy to use and really straightforward, and some things may take a little bit more to manage. So in the data store, uh, you know, it, it, it takes, it underlines and underpins all of the cybers resources. Uh, it really is meant to manage data across the entire life cycle. So there are ways to make sure that the data doesn't just come to cybers and sit there, but actually it gets published it gets moved to other repositories. Uh, so we don't want Cybers, and uh, as you become really aware of the resources you have, you don't want Cybers to just become um, a backup disk that's sitting there. 
you actually really want to make the use of your data such that when it's on cyber it's stuff that you're working on. Um, now that said, there are times in cyber uh, might need to be uh, or hold some type of data publication service because there's not another appropriate repository and that's a, another conversation. Um, it is true that the data on Cybers are automatically backed up. So that's something that you don't on a day-to-day -day basis need to think of. But again, um, we wanna be um, very frugal with the way that we use things. And there are numerous ways to upload, download, and share. I will cover those in some capacity when I talk about how to manage that data, but I'm actually gonna rely upon things that we already have published on the Learning Center, videos and tutorials. So if there are some more basic um, skills that I don't cover today, I'll end with the learning resources and also take any questions. And then this is all based upon an open source technology called IROTS, which is really nice because it, it makes things automated. And because it's an open source technology, there's confidence there that what you have and what's working in cybers today uh, will really continue to work um, in, in the years to come because it's uh, based upon the work of an active community. So uh, here is the bottom line. Uh, currently on Cybers, uh, as you may know, we are in a subscription model and there are various subscriptions that you can learn more about at cybers.org slash subscribe. And um, I've only focused on one element of the features that come with any given tier of subscription, uh, which is the, the data feature. So at the very basic level, uh, your storage limit is five gigabytes. It's enough to be able to uh, play around with some things, see a little bit about how Cybers works. But ultimately, if you're going to be doing pretty intense analysis, you're probably going to be looking for a subscription that allows you a bit more of those resources. But even still, there are some limits here. That said as well, um, if you need even more space than we have advertised, uh, that's a support question because we do have arrangements where there are uh, customized things that we can provide for anyone who needs um, more resources than what the, the off-the-shelf um, subscription does. So um, I thought I would uh, basically take us through our time. I'm, I'm already, uh, we're already almost 10 minutes into the webinar, 30 minutes, by giving you a couple of frequently asked questions and then demonstrating the answers. So we'll see how work, well this works because I might flip uh, back and forth a little bit about the slides, or maybe I'll cover the question and then I'll, I'll show you a, a practical hands-on demo just so you have a clue and then we'll take questions. One of the very first questions that you might wanna ask is how do I know how much data I'm using? This is a great question and it's not always obvious and I'll show you why and then how to get the answer to that. So there are a couple of ways to know how much data you are using. And the very first and easiest way is to log on to the Discovery Environment dashboard. So let me show you that, uh, just so you have a sense how it looks, and then we'll move on to some other questions. So um, I'm actually probably logged into the Discovery Environment right now, um, but let me actually log out and log in just so that we're really starting from scratch. So uh, this is the Discovery Environment at dia.cybers.org. Uh, if you were to go to the Discovery Environment, which is also um, available from the Cybers homepage, you might see some videos and some featured applications, but to actually see more information about your own service, you'll need to go ahead and log in. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. And the very first thing that you will see when you log in is this resource usage. So this is one of the easiest questions to say overall, how much data am I, am I using? So it says as of 43 minutes ago, which is the last time um, I guess they took the measurement, I'm using about 4.6 terabytes. Um, I have a lot of data and probably there's a lot here that I haven't gone through myself, I'm pretty guilty. I have the commercial subscription, which I as a staff member are not paying for, but you have to pay for uh, potentially. So it would be wise of me to go through this and that's gonna be uh, the next things I'm gonna show you. Uh, yeah, this shows you exactly overall how much you're using. That's the first place you may want to look. Now, the next question, which gets a little bit more nuanced, is, well, what happens if I hit my storage limit? Because um, you could be doing data analysis, and you could run into a situation in which you're going to be creating lots of files, or it may be that you're a Cypress user who's been using for a long time, perhaps before the subscription model, and you, one day you're told that you're at the limit of resources, what you do. Well, the very first answer is that you won't be able to add new data. 
okay, uh, so that's a stopping point, which will get you past. But there are a couple of options that you, you should know. And I'll say to this, and it's probably in a future slide, uh, when you hit your storage limit, you're not gonna lose data. We're not going to start saying, okay, this is going to be deleted for you. You're at this point, um, the policy is that you will be paused there. So there are a couple of options that you have. Um, you can delete some data. Uh, and oftentimes there are lots of data sets that you, know, you, haven't, you, you don't need or intermediate files or things that are not important. And so you can delete that, I'm gonna cover that. Or of course, uh, you can upgrade your data tier. And so um, if you upgrade your script subscription, then obviously your quota will change. So um, the next question may not seem obvious at first, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through the different answers. I'm gonna show you exactly why um, this is a little bit more, I don't wanna say difficult, but a little bit more involved than just taking a look at a folder and trying to figure out how much data is let's say compared to how you might do it on a desktop computer. So how can I tell how much data is in a folder? It depends on how you are actually accessing the data store. So if you use this tool that I'll show in a moment called CyberDuck, it will on the left-hand side show you uh, that you have various files and folders. Now, the thing that you need to pay attention to on the left-hand side, I've sort of zoomed out, Individual files, like a PowerPoint file or CSV, it tells you exactly how much they are in terms of size, a kilobyte, 3.5 gigabytes. But one thing that you may run into is that folders themselves, you know, traditionally in the way that Linux does things and also Cypress by extension, the folders themselves are marked zero size. So you might look at this and say, wait a second, how could I be over when in fact it's telling me that these folders are zero? The folder itself is, is basically an object that doesn't have or doesn't take up much space, but the folders may contain other files which do can take up space. So you can't be fooled by looking at it that way. Um, the same thing holds for web DAV or web DAV. Um, if you haven't connected this way, if you go to data.cybers.org slash dash slash iPlant slash home slash your username on your local machine, like I've done this uh, slide on a Mac, you can actually connect. This is no longer CyberDuck but this is actually what it looks like when I do this on my regular file browser. The same would be true if you're using Windows or Linux. Uh, you have these ways to connect that allow you to see what's going on. And again, individual files actually have a size, but folders, if you know here, it's actually cleverly marked as dash dash, meaning, hey, you have a folder, but how much is in it? You'll need to take a, a closer look. So you can also do this for those of you who access the data store using I commands. And notice I'm not going to each one of these things on how to set them up. We have learning materials, but I'm just speaking to an audience which might use any one of these. Um, through I commands, you can use a command. It's a little bit complicated, but it will also show you exactly how many bits any given file is. So there are, there are various ways to do that. However, the very best way, which I'll demonstrate quickly now, is to actually use an application that we have built in that can give you a much more useful look inside the data store. And this is called Data Hog. So I'm going to demonstrate that in a moment. And with Data Hog, you have the ability to actually get a pretty good breakdown, this is not the whole thing, of what is in any given folder or directory. So let's try this out live. I have one running, but I'm also going to just go ahead and try to uh, do one from scratch. So. I believe I am sharing, okay, great, uh, the whole thing. And if you go into, I see I have a data hog uh, analysis running. If you go into applications, it should be one of the featured applications. So you don't even have to search for it. And you can click on data hog. Um, one of the things you'll do that's a little bit, you'll go through this process called, you know, uh, as you run other applications, if you're familiar with it, it does give you the option to input files that you actually really don't have to get started. Really, you can, you can click to step four or skip to four and click launch analysis. So what this is going to launch is an application that is capable of scanning a given folder within, the, within your um, discovery environment, within your data store, and then giving you an output uh, of, uh, of, of that folder's contents and summing up things and, and generating graphics so you can tell is that folder taking up a lot of space without actually having to click into it and go through every single one. So if I click on go uh, to analysis, it's gonna open up a new tab and I'm gonna get an interface that I need to uh, log into. Uh, 
you'll notice that there's some options here and you there are some extended usage. I believe we have a webinar on data hog itself. Um, I'm not going to go into all of these. I'm just going to stick to something very simple, which is looking at a specific folder in the data store. Now to do that, I'm going to go back to the discovery environment. I'm going to click on the data tab. I'm going to take a look through my data store. So here I have a whole bunch of folders and I really have no idea just looking at them, how big they might be. Uh, some of them might be huge. Some of them might have not have very um, much stuff in it. Um, if I click on any given folder, I can go in and there's another folder and there might be another folder. Okay, this one didn't look like it's too bad, but you can imagine that at a certain point, folders within folders within folders, it's very difficult to see what's going on. I'll also comment here that there's a special, if you've been using Cybers for a while, uh, especially the discovery environment, there's a special folder here called analyses. And analyses is important because just about everything you do in the discovery environment ends up in here. And this is a place where you could definitely uh, think about, in my case, as you see right here, uh, are these uh, analyses of intermediate things, uh, analyses I've only done once, are these things to delete? You can always sort by date um, and, and get a picture, but at a certain point, you can't click in each one of these. So I'm going to go back and choose a folder for data hog to look at. Um, I'm going to choose uh, this one. I have no idea what's in it. It's a couple folders. Um, hmm. Let's see. That one is as good as any. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and here I can click these three dots and just want to copy the path um, because I need to tell data hug what to look at. So I'm going to sell it to look at that particular folder. I do need to enter my password. And I'm going to go ahead and say import from, from IROS. So it's going to take a few moments. One warning here is that the larger the folder is in terms of its contents and what's there, the longer this process will take. So be patient if you are importing a folder that has lots and lots and lots of things. And I would actually be careful if you're gonna do this with your analyses folder, it may take a significant amount of time because there's so much for it to look at. But a data head pod has gone ahead and it basically has gone through and told me how many files, um, how many folders, what type of extensions are there, right? There's a BAM file and there's a BAI file, the odd BAMs are obviously bigger. And it also gives me a breakdown of the sizes of everything. It tells me how old they are, what, how new they are, et cetera. So this is a really useful tool um, to go through. Um, there is a way to browse and look through uh, files as well, where you could go through um, and, and see what's inside in more detail. If there were duplicates, um, that's also a place where you could be selective about how I want to delete things. So. All right, let's keep going because we still got a few more questions to cover. So data hog is definitely gonna be something that you wanna take a look at. Um, the next thing is how can I delete data? And this is a good question because again, it's not necessarily hard, but it may not be as simple as clicking something and deleting it and it's gone. So you have your choice. Um, I'm gonna show you today with a discovery environment how to do this and it's fairly straightforward. But each one of those tools that I showed you before, iCommands, WebDAV, CyberDuck, those also give you the ability to delete um, things. So let me show you this uh, quickly in the discovery environment. So I'm back in the discovery environment and um, let's just sort of say, well, here's a folder called Bioproject Temp. So I, I think I'm, I'm gonna be okay deleting this. Um, I can select that folder or I could select multiple folders. And then uh, under more actions here, I have the ability, whoops, can't see all my buttons. I have the ability to go ahead and move it to the trash. So one of the very first things that you should think about is that I get a little notification is that actually uh, when you are working with uh, moving the data that it may actually not be deleted, just like on your computer, oftentimes there is a trash. Um, and so when you do those types of things, oops, I'm trying to uh, go there, um, you need to expand the menu and click on trash to actually see what's located in your trash. Now, the other thing, I'm gonna click refresh here, is that uh, I, del I deleted that and it may take, we'll come back around to see because I'm not gonna wait for it, uh, it may actually take a few moments 
for something to to go from um, there we go to for something to go from where you thought it was into the trash. And I will say that this is again somewhat proportional to the size and the number of files that you are trying to move to the trash. So if you have something that is very large file sizes or thousands or tens of thousands of files, please be patient because it will take time for those things to be uh, labeled as trash. And then at the very last step, it will take time for you to go ahead and say, okay, let's go ahead and empty the trash, uh, which I'd be comfortable doing here. And it will also, again, take time for you to go to um, your home and see that after you've made um, a deletion, that um, the that that's reflected, and it will take time. You know, this says that the last measurement was an hour ago, so you can imagine that um, this is a place where patience. So, don't try to delete things multiple times and be a bit careful about it. This is this applies double when you're doing something like I commands or we're using something of the other tools like Cyberduck or WebDAV, where it may take these times, and you may think that something is moved, but you still see it. Um, kind of be patient there. Okay, let's wrap this up and then take as many questions as you can. Um, so those are some options. All of those systems allow you to delete. Um, I wanna emphasize that uh, if you go back to the Learning Center at learning.cybers.org, we have documentation on all of this. And in fact, uh, from the data documentation, there's even more detailed documentation in the data store manual. So take a look at that in the managing your data section of learning.cybers.org. If all else fails, reach out to support and let them know if you're having an issue. Um, if you're deleting something and you know it's like a really big, uh, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of files, or you just have any anxiety, you know, send a message. Um, people will try to respond. Obviously, uh, it does take a little bit of time for staff to respond to things. If you have a higher tier, you have the chat support. Um, but let us know if something is giving you anxiety and looking through the documentation doesn't help. Uh, we'd rather know about it and be there to assist you if you run into an issue. So with that, I want to thank you. I am going to stop my share. And uh, we've got a few minutes here for questions. And I'll take a look. I don't see any, um, I don't see any, any uh, thing in the chat so far, except that Tina has dropped in a link to the data store. I'm sorry, the data hog uh, application where we have a whole separate video on that. So at this time, uh, I'm here to take any questions that you have and really see how we can help you. But other than that, you know, take a look through it and let us know because um, we're still uh, new to the subscription model ourselves, And we really do value feedback from our users to tell us um, how things are working or where you're hitting bottlenecks and what you'd like to see from us to deliver value uh, for your subscription. So I'll wait here for a, a minute or two and see if there are any questions. And of course, this will be recorded so that'll be available in a few days and you can come back to this at your leisure uh, once that's back. So thank you very much. And I'll sit back uh, just in case questions come up. Otherwise, have a great weekend. Jason, <clears throat> I, I did receive a, a question. It's, it's pretty generic, but it might be a good time to give a good overview. This person says, I have a fair amount of experience with HPC, high performance computing, NICs, and programming, I support the US government and research and development branches for the government. Could I get a quick demo of how a scientist might start using cybers in general? Um, this might be way more for, for than our question time, but at least maybe reorient people to the DE and stuff like that. Sure, so yeah. I would answer that question actually by pointing out a good place to start since yes, as you predict, this is way more uh, than I would be able to cover in just the time that we have. Uh, so let me share my screen and point out two resources and I'll give a quick like 30 second look at the discovery environment. So the first thing I'd, I'd like to point you to is to Cyber's Learning. And one of the first things there is a uh, self-guided course, which really has a number of, of chapters that goes through everything from the background of the project uh, to thinking about data management using the project, to how to run an analysis, and everything comes with really a nice, fairly straightforward, so it won't take a lot of time tutorial, as well as videos there to guide you. So this is definitely a place that I would substitute for the minute that I have to show you. Um, but in terms of getting started, at the 
uh, the discovery environment, this is meant to be an easy place for people who may not necessarily be command line savvy and prefer working in a graphical user environment um, that they can go and uh, you, you might start with data and actually uploading data um, for very, for let's say smaller things, you can sort of browse local data sets on your computer or import them from the URL. But what the um, learning materials will go into is how to use some drag and drop or um, other types of connections so that you can bring in larger data sets and then have them available. Once they are available, um, if you're using the discovery environment, then you can use applications. And that can be everything from launching an RStudio or a Jupyter Notebook, but there are a whole bunch of applications we specialize, but not exclusive to uh, things like genomics, molecular biology, and stuff like that. So if I search for an application, uh, in my case for um, RNA seq, uh, it will start to I'm just uh, it will start to find um, versions of that application that I might be interested in using. Um, so if I go and say, okay, I want to run you know Callisto. It, it almost is like a web checkout where you would sort of say, okay, what files and folders, uh, what options or parameters, and you go through the list of, you know, choosing, uh, building almost like a, a, a checkout process where you're able to launch that. And if it's an interactive uh, thing, you might get a Jupyter notebook in the next tab, or if it's just something that can run and then come back with a result, those will come back with notifications and you'll see that. Uh, you may also do things which I will not be able to do right now, Let's see. Yeah, it, 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 it uh, counts against my quota. I have to close one of my data hot sessions. You could launch a cloud shell. You could um, see the history of the analyses. So I would really recommend uh, taking a look at the self-guided tour, but then um, you don't need very much more than a nice, uh, I'll, I'll close one of them. Uh, you don't need very much more than a web browser to get started with analyzing the data yeah, there are also some tutorials and other things there. So really uh, start at the cyber home, uh, learning home and then let us know um, if you have more questions. Okay, and I see a question in the chat um, about uh, looking at the verifying the checksums if you've done a large data upload. So absolutely, there are a couple of ways to see that. Um, you mentioned I commands, and so there is definitely an I command um, that will, I believe it's the I meta command that will give you in that command line environment uh, a look at what your checksums are. And also, if you look at any data set, uh, specifically any, any given uh, data, uh, this is a DS yeah, store, so it's not a really, <laughs> shouldn't be there in the first place. Uh, but if you look at any given uh, item in, within the discovery environment within the data store, the checksums are calculated. So they're really easy to see what they are. And if you are on a um, using I commands, uh, you can check the documentation, but I believe it's uh, I meta. You can definitely see what the checksum is or recalculate a checksum of anything on the fly to verify that um, your data have been successfully transferred. Um, there's a question from Tina that you're referring. Uh, which is on metadata. Does metadata count against my data quota? I don't believe so, because metadata, Rob can correct me if I'm wrong, but metadata is probably stored in the IROD system. Uh, and I don't think there's like, it's it's discreetly, I don't know if it like makes your file bigger. I think it's a different thing. Rob is giving me a thumbs up, which might mean that I'm right there. So it's not, uh, it's pretty trivial. It shouldn't count against your data quota. I've got time for more questions, if there are some. We're willing to stay over a few minutes. People can feel free to unmute if they prefer. We often use the chat just to uh, make sure if we have a large crowd, but since this is fairly uh, intimate crowd, feel free to unmute. Um, while we're waiting for to see if there's any more questions, I do want to one, thank Nirav and Jason especially for uh, going through this important stuff because this is the kind of things that we get a lot of support questions asked on. And so um, this will really help I also want to let you know that next week, a week from right now, we will have another webinar and that's going to be presented by Connor Copeland of the University of Montana. And he's going to demonstrate the basics of an analysis pipeline manager called NextFlow DSL2. So join us same place, same time, same link uh, for that. Um, in the meantime, a... are there more questions? 
Yes, there's one question about um, installation of applications. And I believe the question is asking, um, does a user have the ability to sort of install their own applications? And so, yes, that's again, something covered on learning that cybers and probably a little bit more complex than I can go into just now, but let me point out two quick ways. So uh, yes, you have the ability. So if you actually come to the um, cybers, uh, discovery environment, there, there's applications which are, you can think of an application as a software tool, which is going to be like a binary or a, or a Python script or whatever it is, plus the wrapping of the Cyverse interface, which makes it uh, in the discovery environment, makes it you know, a GUI that you can click and point and run through our uh, sort of uh, interface. Uh, but there's also something called tools and the tools are the actual individual um, things, and they're always uh, containerized. You can kind of tell by looking at here um, that they are containerized tools that either users have brought in and um, or or that we have installed. Uh, so what you need to do to make your own tool available to Cybers is you would need to uh, look at the list of tools and add a tool where you would sort of give a link to a container. Um, on Docker Hub or somewhere else. And essentially what you have the right to do is to uh, integrate some tools for your own usage. But then if you wanna make those tools, uh, share them with other people, or if you wanna make them public, there are different levels of progression that you can have the rights to do that. Um, and there's also a matter of then being able to uh, build using an interface your sort of step-by-step walkthrough of what it takes to launch that tool. Um, there are other ways. So if you launch, which I will be able to do now because I closed and only limited to two of these types of sessions, you could be using something like the web shell. And in which case, if we're using something like the web shell in a moment, it's going to be uh, dropping into uh, a Linux environment where Conda is installed. And I could go through the process of saying, you know, Conda search, I could start searching for a tool. I don't know if I'm going to wait for this forever, but it's now going to search for that same Callisto tool. And in this sort of, oops, I touched too many buttons. In this sort of walled garden, I do have the ability to start to install tools in an ephemeral sense so that I can work on things. So I could go through the process of installing it here. I could launch a Jupyter Notebook and start to install it there. So long story short, um, yes, there is some ability to, um, to make uh, some tools available. And then to follow up on the second question I see you've entered now is that if you want to take that tool and now make it available to a group of people or to the public, yes, that is possible, but you need to go through a process of approval so that we're uh, certain that the tool is appropriate, it's not malicious, um, there's somebody that's responsible for it. But in principle, uh, there's definitely, you should definitely think of Cybers as a place where you can develop your tools. And we are now five minutes over time. So I think um, we can wrap it up. And uh, I would invite you to contact us through support or as the video comes out to ask questions. And my uh, name, my Twitter name was out there, which is maybe is now Goss, but you can always email me also, williams at cshl.edu, if you have questions. And we'd be more than happy to try to do our best and help you with that. So I'll leave it to Tina to wrap us up and to thank everybody and have a great weekend. Thank you, Jason. Yes, uh, see you back here next week, I hope. Um, and you can also find videos on our slash webinar page. So go to cybers.org, go to the webinar page, and there's um, this video will be posted there later on today, probably. And you can also find all of our playlists and lists of, I think we're close to 75 videos now. So See y'all back here next week. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Nirav. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks, everyone. Bye.